So welcome back, everybody. So we're approaching the Bergerwein. So there's uh, fewer and fewer participants in this class. And today's topic will be a refresher course on projection models and camera calibration. And obviously, that is a, a very good topic right before the Bergkirchweih, because maybe if you go up there, something might happen that you need to calibrate your vision. So that's always useful that you can calibrate your vision uh, on the Bergkirchweih. And don't, don't worry, um, we will only talk about one eye. So for back, one eye is sufficient. Yeah? It's always the risk that you get hit, and then <laughs> you only calibrate one eye. And after 10 days of Bergkirchweih, you will hear about stereo vision. Yeah? Then I will tell you how you can calibrate both of your eyes. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> great. So today, projection models and some camera calibration. So we will uh, talk uh, a bit about the projection models and we will introduce a concept called homogeneous coordinates. And you've already seen this in the previous lecture. I uh, didn't detail it too much, uh, but the concept is fairly, um, fairly easy to follow and it absolutely makes sense and will allow us to calibrate our uh, projective uh, cameras much better. So let's talk a bit about the motivation. So we've seen um, that uh, we require quite some detailed knowledge about uh, the, the projection and given an X-ray image, for example, you want to be able to figure out that any point that you observe in your scene or also in a, in a normal camera image, you want to figure out the ray that connects uh, a point of interest and a pixel in the scene. So this is the ray that is acquired by the camera. And it doesn't matter too much whether it's an X-ray image or whether it's an, um, it is a typical camera image. You typically have a bundle of rays that is emerging from a focal spot or from a camera center. And then uh, you are acquiring those rays and the inf uh, re uh, respective information about those rays. So the the thing that we will deal uh, with today is how can we mathematically describe all of those rays and um, we will actually consider different projection geometries. First and foremost, um, because some of these projection geometries can be modeled uh, much simpler in a mathematical sense and then we will derive how we can actually uh, also tackle projective uh, geometry because this is what we have in the most cases. We have some, some focal center and we have um, a divergent rays that emerge into the scene. So once we have found a model to describe this, we will then think about uh, how we can actually calibrate the parameters of the model. So this is the camera calibration part. And uh, using those param parameters, we will then be able to associate uh, pixels with lines uh, in world coordinates, which will allow us to compute paths, uh, for example, of x-rays or of uh, lines into the scene. And another thing that we will think about is how reliable actually the estimates are. But we will only shortly discuss this. So, um, but of course, once, once you estimate something, you want to figure out how robust your estimate is and uh, how reproducible it is. And um, if you have numerical instabilities, of course, you want to know about that. And we will look into ways of determining this. So this is um, a very simple sketch of, um, of an X-ray uh, acquisition system. And this is actually the version that Röntgen was building uh, over 100 years ago. He was building such kind of um, uh, of X-ray um, imaging systems and you have your tube and here you have some, some film material where you can actually gather the amount of X-rays that arrive at the respective position at the film and if you put something in between the X-rays get attenuated and you can see the amount of attenuation in the resulting image. And it is interestingly, uh, in the terms of the projective geometry, this system is very similar to what we have today as well. So we have some, some tube and some, some anode where the X-rays emerge from. And we have essentially, if we have an ideal system, um, as one, just one single point that is um, infinitely small. And from this point, all the X-rays emerge and they go into the scene. So in uh, CT reconstruction, we will also call this a cone beam geometry. Um, or uh, in 
computer vision, you talk typically talk about a perspective geometry that is uh, given by such a scene. So already, uh, such long time ago, you, we already had this kind of um, setup for acquisition. And we can actually describe this in, uh, but in the end, what we are interested in is some, uh, some world or volume coordinate system that is, for example, given by a voxel grid, like uh, 3D uh, volume elements. And this voxel grid um, is, is uh, traversed by the X-rays. So this is the optical center. And from the optical centers, all these X-rays traverse our volume of interest. And then they hit the detector plane, and at every point on the detector plane, we collect the line integral along this ray. So this is our um, imaging geometry, and this is uh, still the same as in the first systems. Good. So what we are interested today, what we are interested in today, is how we can actually describe the the path of the rays very efficiently, and to figure out the parameters that we actually need to describe a relation between the volume coordinates the, and the detector coordinates. So we want to be able to figure out how can we compute from a given world coordinate point the position on the detector that it is projected to. This is the main goal that we want to figure out today. And after we found the model, we will talk about how we actually can uh, compute the model parameters. So we'll talk a bit about ge uh, projection geometries. And here uh, you can actually see an also very old illustration about uh, perspective projection and uh, how you can actually go ahead and create a, a perspective image. Yeah? So you can uh, even build this uh, um, apparatus and you can use a wire and go to different points in this image and then you have your imaging plane here, you hold a pen here, uh, where the wire traverses the imaging plane, and then you can flap this board back and make a dot. So in this way, you can create a perspective uh, projection. And this is exactly um, the idea. So we have the optical center here. This is our optical center, because the wire is always fixed here. And um, independent, so it doesn't matter where we point the wire to, we will always have the intersection of all these rays in the optical center. So this is a perspective projection. And this is um, what they uh, realized. This is very, uh, this is essentially how human vision works. Yeah? You have um, an optical center, and then the rays are gathered uh, along lines. And depending on how you move your camera center, you will get a different perspective. And you have all kinds of variation that happens once you move the camera center. And of course, uh, this will, al will also be affected once you move the imaging plane. So if you m start moving this frame here, this will also, of course, change the image that is generated by the system. So the 2D image, the, the projected image, is uh, indexed by a 2D coordinate system with x, y. And um, we can, in general, um, define our system in such a way that we choose the axis that is perpendicular to the imaging plane to be aligned with the z-axis, the z-axis. Yeah. So this way, we can figure out a coordinate system that will describe the image plane or the detector plane in x and y. And everything that goes into the depth coordinate is described by, uh, by the letter c. Good. Generally, a very simple way of describing a projective model is an autographic projection. And the idea in an autographic projection, and let's, let's draw a bit. So I think we had some, some drawing material here as well. Yes. yes? Where is it? Hmm? Ah. OK. So if we had had x-ray vision, we would have been able to see it. Yeah. But OK, anyway. So this is an autographic projection. So let's go back to what I mentioned earlier. So we, we were talking about an, um, a focal center, but actually for the um, autographic projection, we don't need a, um, a focal spot. Yeah. So all that we need is an imaging plane. And in the autographic projection, let's say this is our, our scene. So there are four points. All that happens 
and, and now you see that everything in, that is in a right angle to this is our z-axis and our xy plane uh, is on is essentially here perpendicular to the blackboard. So if we do orthographic projection, all that we're doing is we're doing uh, just an orthogonal projection onto our detector plane. So this is all that's happening here. And this is fairly simple because uh, essentially we don't need to define a camera center here because we can move this plane back and forth along the Z direction and it doesn't matter. We will always get the same image. So we get we entirely remove everything that is associated with depth. So in an orthographic projection, you you do not do not perceive depth anymore, yeah? because everything is just in a parallel way projected onto your uh, onto your detector or onto your uh, CCD chip. And the nice thing is now that we can just discard the third co uh, component in our uh, projection. So all that we need to do is. We kick off the last component um, from our vector and then we already have done our projection. So we can very nicely write this into a, a matrix notation. If we multiply this vector with this matrix, we just uh, discard the last component and all that remains here is x and y. So this is the orthographic projection. Now what you realize immediately if you try to do that um, this means that your detector always has to be the same size as your object. If your object is large, you need a large detector. Uh, so you're not uh, able to describe any kind of magnification in this. So one way to do that is to say, well, let's do the projection and then magnify. So we try to um, compute a model that will be able to explain somehow magnification. And this is the weak perspective, weak perspective projection. And here we associate a scaling factor k. So k will describe us the amount of magnification or uh, also uh, downscaling. So we will be able to do this as a multiplication. So all what it's doing is essentially computing a projection and then we scale with some scale k, which will then uh, start uh, um, reducing the size of the object. It's still orthographic and all of the scaling is only done in the uh, detector plane. So again, the, all of the information um, along the depth axis is completely lost. The scaling is only determined by your k factor and k is a property of the projection. So you will always get the same scaling independent on how far the object is away. But using such a model, you are able at least to describe a, a change in size. So this is not a model that you typically see in, uh, in, in the real world, but it is a model that, um, is able, uh, that we are able to describe mathematically, and it will be approximately true if all of, these, uh, of, all of your points are rather far away and they are approximately the same distance. If they're approximately the same distance, this is a rather good approximation of reality. So this is called a weak perspective projection. And all we do is we do a, uh, a orthographic projection and then apply a scaling. And now if you look at the, at the update rule, again, this is entirely independent uh, of the depth. So Z is gone. And you have K in the matrix. So the variable k, the scaling factor, is a property of your projection. So this is, would be one of the parameters that we want to calibrate. In this orthographic projection, we have no parameters. All we do is we map onto the, onto the detector of the same size. And here we can at least estimate um, a scaling. But uh, imagine you would want to use this, then every time you go farther or closer to an object, you have to calibrate your camera parameters again. So this would not be robust to, to a move of the scene. If you approach closer to the object, you would have to recalibrate your camera parameters. So this is, the nice thing with this is, of course, this is linear. We can describe it by a matrix. 
So it's a linear technique, but it's not very realistic. What you can do then as well is um, you can try to plug in more things that it uh, approaches a realistic. So in the end, what you want to have is a perspective projection, because this is what we typically see in camera images. Yeah, so we see a perspective projection. So we can even extend this weak uh, uh, perspective model further, then you end up with something that is called the power perspective uh, projection. And this is still linear. And what you're doing in here is you introduce an auxiliary plane and then you project onto the auxiliary plane. And the auxiliary plane is in the centroid of your points. And once you have projected onto this plane, you apply a parallel projection to all points onto this auxiliary plane. Then uh, those points are mapped by perspective projection onto the image plane. And um, this would be identical to performing a scaled orthographic projection because by introducing this auxiliary plane, you make sure that everything is on a plane. And once everything is on a plane, you can ap apply a weak perspective model. And this is why this is called a power perspective model and it's still linear. But for us, it's not that relevant. This is why we also don't look uh, into the actual um, update equation. Uh, so this is, an, is still an affine mapping. But what we are actually interested in is the perspective projection. And now in the perspective projection, we have all of these effects that we actually want to have. So let's say we have an object, again denoted by four points. Now we introduce a focal center. So this is our camera center. And the actual projection is then performed in a way that you connect the point by a line with your camera center. So this must be the camera center. And then you have another line here. Does this help? Let's see if this helps. Much better. Okay, so this is then our projection. And they all intersect at this point, and here you get your projected points. And now you realize that, of course, the depth of the point makes uh, is important. So if I choose a point that is at the same level as this one, but very far away, you realize that it will be projected onto a position of the detector that is much lower than the other point. So it's still uh, connected here, but this point is projected here, while this point is projected up here. So depth does matter, actually, in our perspective projection. OK. So now what we actually want to get, or how we can compute this, uh, is simply um, by setting up. Uh, so you can actually compute this point, because every time um, you're projecting, you're essentially doing a, a, a stretching. So this means that this uh, distance compared um, to, let me think about that, yeah, the distance here over the distance here must be similar to uh, the distance here to the distance here. So what we get from that is that our projected point, so let's call this x prime, the point in the projected uh, position needs to be, um, so let's go back, so x over x prime needs to be f over z. Yeah? So you have x prime, so let's, let's take this point here, then this is x prime, here is x prime, and this is x. Um, this is x. And x prime over x needs to be um, like f over z. Yeah? f over z, or if it's this point, it's back here. So this over this needs to be identical to x prime over x. And now if you solve this, so you multiply with x, so you get x prime equals to f divided by z times x fx over z. 
So this is, uh, this is just a, a simple uh, trigonometric operation. And of course, this is the same for y. So for y prime, you will get that f times y over z uh, will be the y coordinate of the projected point. OK, good. So we want to find a linear mapping now. So what we want to get in the end is we plug something in that looks like this. Let's go to the second uh, second board. We no, we can actually do it here. So we, we want to take our vector x, y, z. Then we want to find some matrix. And what we want to get from that is f times x over z and f times y over z. Right? So we want to find the matrix that computes this. How must th does the matrix look like that will compute this? Hmm? Diagonal. Well, so what do we need here? Well, we need, um, we have x here. So we need to multiply um, with, with f. So then we get x. So we need to have f over z here, 0, 0, and 0, f over z here. You see? Which means that our linear mapping here is dependent on z. So we kick, out, kick it out here, but it becomes part of the matrix. So for every point, we have a different matrix, which is uh, kind of uncool. Yeah? So our matrix becomes dependent on z. And uh, we don't find a linear mapping that will produce this. Huh? So there is no linear mapping that will produce uh, this vector here. So um, this is pretty bad. Uh, we can't find a linear mapping for this. But we can still visualize the three projection models here with the auxiliary plane. Um, the, the, the orthogonal is one. Then we have the uh, weak perspective one, which is, is similar to, uh, to two. And we have, um, we have three, which is the weak, um, no, we have three, which is, ah, it's, it's reordered. So one is orthographic, two is perspective, this is the direct connection, then three is weak perspective, and four is Paris perspective. So this Paris perspective one has the auxiliary plane. Okay, good. So uh, the projections um, 1 and 2 can be uh, expressed by linear mappings. Projection 4 can be uh, defined in terms of an affine mapping. And the perspective projection uh, is nonlinear. This is what we want to um, derive from these observations. Uh, and we can see that here from, from our matrix already. And the bad thing is now, all the time we want to deal with these perspective projections, and now they are nonlinear. It's uncool. That would be so much nicer if everything were linear. So we have to deal with it somehow. And what do we do? Well, we think about, some, uh, about it, and then we come up with an, a very nice concept that is called homogeneous coordinates. And with this, we will have uh, much less problems with the projection, with the perspective projection. So let's go ahead and look a bit at homogeneous coordinates. And homogeneous coordinates is a, is a fairly simple trick, because what we do in homogeneous coordinates is we map a 2D space or a 1D space into a one di uh, higher dimensional space. So you can think of, let's take a 1D space, and we align the 1D space like this. And we have the value 1 here. And what we do is we expand the space with another dimension. So we uh, blow up a 1D space into a 2D space or a 2D space into a 3D space. And the way that we do it is we just extend um, by another component, which will include a 1. So we define this point here with the coordinate 1, 1. And now what we do is we define that if we want to go back into our original space, the last component needs to be 1. So we have to normalize with the last component. 
And if you do that, you will realize that the point 1, 1 and the point 2, 2, they will be identical. Because if you take the point 2, 2 and divide by 2, you end by 1, 1. Okay? Doing so, what you actually get is a set of points. So th the point 1, 1 and the point 2, 2, they lie on a line. And this line intersects at the point here. Yeah? And of course, you can expand this further. Yeah? Everything on this is in the same line. And all of those points, if you normalize them in a way that they have a 1 in the last component, they will all be projected onto this point here. This means that in our expanded space, in our homogeneous space, which is a uh, projective space, by the way, all of our points from the 1D space will form a line in our 2D space. So we can do the same for the point one, uh, 2, 1, and 2, 1 will be described by this line. And all the same points will be in this space. And we can go into the homogeneous space. The homogeneous space is, of course, a 2D space. And by dividing over the last component, we return to our original space. And what we are forming is a space that essentially is spanning such a fan here. So this space somehow may, may look weird, but it's incredibly useful. Because we can do a lot of things in the space that uh, we cannot simply do in our Cartesian space. So this is our... Uh, projective space that we just introduced. And often we describe our Cartesian space R2 and the associated uh, projective space with this P2. Uh, this is a projective space in homogeneous coordinates and every point in this uh, projective space has actually as a vector of three components. And sometimes we indicate that by a tilde. So uh, if you blow up a point to be homogeneous, then you indicate that by associating a tilde with the respective variable. So here we have a Cartesian point P in xy, and we can represent it by a point wx, wy, w. Now if we divide over the last component, we get to the point xy. So our point xy is associated with the homogeneous point wx, wy, and w. And this is our homogeneous point. Um, you can easily figure out that if you have a point uh, with w uh, equals to zero, you have a singularity. So if you have a point that has a zero in the last component, you will not be able to return to your original space because you have to divide by zero and uh, you won't be able to find a, find a point here. Uh, and in general, w is an arbitrary uh, real-valued constant. So, yeah. And if you have an arbitrary vector in homogeneous coordinates and you want to go to your Cartesian space, you divide over the last component and you're, you're all good. And this is incredibly useful, as you, may, uh, as you will see, for our projections, perspective projections. So another thing that is interesting is you suddenly have a different, um, you have a different uh, notion of equality in the space. Because equality in this space is um, identical up to scaling. So um, all points must lie on a line. Yeah? So if I have this point and this point, uh, if I can create this point by a linear combination or by a, uh, up by a scaling of the other point, they are identical. So, that's an, so if I, I mean equality in a homogeneous uh, space, it's identical up to a scaling factor. It's also important. So if you compute if you compute uh, just an L2 distance between two points, then uh, they, there may be a really high distance, but, but just you compute the, the difference vector and uh, compute the L2 norm, you may end up having a huge distance, but in fact it's the same point. It's just because they're differently scaled. Yeah? So you have to be very careful with the, with the norms that you do in the space. If you really want to have uh, identity, you have to be careful with that. 
Okay, so this is now our homogeneous point, and this homogeneous point uh, is now indicated, it's denoted by a tilde. Yeah. And uh, whenever we use uh, homogeneous spaces in this class, we will indicate it with a tilde over the variable. So this is a homogeneous point. And here we will also introduce a different kind of equality. So the equality that we come up with here is um, the uh, p tilde and q tilde, they're equivalent if p tilde equals to lambda times uh, q tilde, then they're equivalent. And you can also find, and of course, uh, uh, lambda is, is not zero. Yeah? So it's not zero. It's it needs to be non-zero. And then you can uh, define this equality here. So you can also find the notation that you put a small tilde over the uh, equal sign. So let's consider an example, the point uh, 2, 3, 1 and the point 3, 6, 2. Are they the same? Well, yes, they're the same. If I divide q uh, over 2, both of them will be mapped to the original Cartesian point 2, 3. So they are the same, although they look quite different. But if they were non-homogeneous points, if they were Cartesian points, of course they would be different. So you have to be careful whether you're working with uh, homogeneous points or whether you're working with 3D Cartesian points. And of course if you have 3D points, the homogeneous points will be 4D points because you add one component. Now we can also think about lines. And if we start thinking about a line equation in R2, this will be ax plus yx plus c equals to zero. So this is a line equation. And now you can also uh, increase this concept to, uh, to, to a, a projective space. So uh, you can actually inc uh, include our uh, w here, which will hold then uh, for non-zero w's. Yeah? So each vector, and now this, uh, this vector here is a, is a vector with three components, and this is not a perspective uh, space. So this is a, 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 um, a Cartesian space, and you can use this vector to represent a line. And this vector um, will form uh, to this way in a Cartesian space. And of course, um, you can multiply with w here. Yeah? doesn't matter if you multiply with w with this line equation uh, because if you divide over w it will form the original line equation. Huh? It's also up to scaling. Good. So uh, in terms of homogeneous coordinates uh, we can state that each 2D line can be represented by a vector ABC. And now I can do things uh, like projecting a point on a line and I can take the inner product of my homogeneous point and the line and if they are zero it will be a member of this line. And then you can also start thinking about intersection of two lines. Then you must find a point that um, fulfills this constraint and this constraint equals to zero. And if you think about that you will figure out that the intersection in a homogeneous space uh, is merely the cross product uh, of the two line uh, variables. Uh, so this is uh, hom uh, these homogeneous spaces are also very, very nice uh, if you want to figure out uh, line intersections and stuff like that. So if you do geometric uh, primitives and geometric operations, it's very useful to use the, the homogeneous spaces. Good, uh, yeah, so uh, one thing that you can also observe um, so, for example, uh, where, where do parallel lines intersect? So you can, you can think about that, um, but we will actually not talk about this here. We will just talk about the application to um, perspective projection here. But there's a, there's a lot more that you can actually think about using homogeneous coordinates and um, computer uh, geometry and doing the computations in, uh, in these spaces. But we are actually skipping over this and uh, there's also very good books um, that uh, talk about uh, doing these computations. You can find a list of references uh, at the end of the slides. 
Now let's use this for going back to our original problem. So you remember our problem and no, no, I'm not showing this. Oh, no, yes, we can show this one. Okay. So let's go back to our original problem. So you realize we had this problem that we wanted to map our uh, 3D point onto this point here. And we didn't find a, a projection matrix here. So we had trouble doing that. So let's think about the parallel projection. Now, if we do a, a, a orthographic projection or parallel projection, we can use homogeneous coordinates. And you will realize that um, if we have our 3D point, uh, it will now look x, y, z, 1. And we have um, our 2D point. And this is also homogeneous, so this is, uh, this is x, y, and 1. And now we can, of course, find a projection matrix that does that. And this matrix simply takes the 1 from here, uh, the x from here. Then in the second component, we take the y. And in the last component, we want to have the 1. So we put in 0, 0, 0. One. Okay. Now we can also think about the weak perspective model. You remember there was some uh, factor k associated with it. So of course this one needs to project onto kx and ky1. And the nice thing if we do that, we can just adopt the notation here. So we can put in k0, 0, 0, 0, 0. 0, uh, 0k, zero, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And we have the same idea as previously. But an interesting property now of this is, I can get to the same point. I can find a representation of this point that will be identical. And I can just take this point and divide by k. So if I do that, I get to the point x, y, 1 over k. So I just divide by k. So this point and this point is identical because they are linearly dependent. So these are two identical points, which means that I can also write up this projection matrix simply as 1, 0, 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 over k. Okay? And this is also an proper, a property that we suddenly get from these projection matrices. Now we have this matrix and this matrix, and they are doing exactly the same um, projection. They are do both doing the weak perspective projection. So they are doing exactly the same. But, of course, the, these are not identical. And you will also realize that all of the projection matrices that we derive here, uh, they are also up to scaling. Yeah? They are identical up to scaling. So if you try to compare um, projection matrices with each other at some point, be aware that they uh, might do the, describe exactly the same geometry, but they are different. So again, you have to think about uh, an appropriate scaling if you are trying to compare projection matrices. If you just subtract them and, and compute a Frobenius norm or something, uh, this will not give you meaningful results. So for example, you could try to scale always this entry to 1. Would be one way of doing that. But um, yeah, you have to think about that uh, if this is a good choice in terms of uh, numerical stability, depending on what kind of geometries you're encoding. Good. So this is our weak perspective projection. And now you can think about, OK, we wanted to have the point uh, f x over z, f y over z. And now we make it homogeneous. So we do 1 here. OK? This is the point that we wanted to get. You remember this is exactly 
our perspective projection. Yeah? And if you make it homogeneous, we just add the one down there. Now we got a bit annoyed because we had uh, the z in here. So what we can do is we can just multiply it with z. So this is uh, homogeneously uh, identical to the point uh, f x, f y, and, and z. Okay, this is the same point because they are only uh, different by a linear scaling. And now you immediately see I can use this trick now x y z1 and now I want to project this guy onto this point here and I can put in um, well I can also find multiple solutions but let's just put the f in here the f in here and then just pick uh, the c component and fill this with zeros and there you go we suddenly found uh, a linear matrix description of the perspective projection. Isn't that awesome? He just found out that it's not possible to describe this with a linear system and now we tuned a bit the space. We just added a dimension. Yeah? We just increased the dimensionality by one and suddenly we are able to describe this uh, perspective projection with a single matrix and we got rid of all of these issues uh, that this matrix were dependent on the last component. That's really awesome, isn't it? All linear, all cool. Okay. Everything quite cool, but uh, of course keep in mind if you are now trying to do L2 optimizations and objective functions, be aware of this identity. It's a homogeneous space. So if you now start plugging everything together and just uh, writing up uh, a simple uh, L2 minimization problem, you may not get the right uh, solution because you have to be careful uh, that you have this identity. So it's all up to scaling. So you have to consider that in your optimization correctly. And we'll see how to do that later. But everything can be rewritten as a nice linear system of equations. And that's cool. And this is in particular very cool because we can then use our favorite tool, SVD, to solve this system. Yeah, and um, this is our weak perspective model. And you see now that we can find two solutions. We either can put the k here and here, or we put one over k here. And uh, of course, we are also able to find our perspective uh, projection which will give us this matrix here is exactly in a matrix as you've seen on the board. Nice. So far we have only considered a camera that was aligned with the camera uh, coordinate system. So our ca coordinate system was always fixed. It was always fixed to the uh, to the z-axis. So we were not able to look into a different direction. But now we can see that we can also use this homogeneous space uh, to encode something which is called extrinsic camera parameters. And extrinsic camera parameters is nothing else but the rotation and translation of the camera in space. These are the extrinsic parameters. And, um, well, what can we do? We can rotate the source in the detector and we can translate the source in the detector. And it doesn't affect this projection whatsoever. The focal length doesn't change if we start rotating and translating the source detector pair. It's always the same operation and the projection. And it's only a rotation and translation. And now we will, yeah, this is the example. This is a C-arm system. And you have the source and the detector fixed. And you can rotate about the patient. And it doesn't change, well, more or less doesn't change anything in the uh, projection parameters. There's one thing that um, actually bothers us a bit. Uh, this C arm here, uh, it's actually not perfectly rigid, but the source side is much heavier than the detector side. So what will happen is that the C uh, will slightly change its uh, shape. So if you have the C position like this, and this is, the, uh, this is our source, then gravity will pull it, pull it downwards. So the source will be slightly closer to the detector than in the opposite direction where the gravity will pull the source downwards and this will increase 
slightly the uh, distance between source and detector. Um, in a typical CRM system, this can make up to one centimeter. Yeah. So in, if you have... Yes, uh, because you have to accelerate. So you don't want to increase the, uh, s the, the you don't want to make the detector heavier um, because in general um, you have to hold the entire structure. So what you actually want to do is make both as light as possible because then you can also save weight on the C. Yeah. And um, the reason why it deforms is because they want to save weight. You will make everything heavier, and if everything becomes heavier, it will be more bulky, and um, you will also take much more force to accelerate and decelerate. And if you do a 3D scan, you want to rotate this entire gantry by uh, 200 degrees within four seconds, and you have to accelerate everything. And the thing that makes the uh, that decides uh, the also the how heavy the or how reliable the structure actually has to be is the acceleration and deceleration and now imagine you have some this is okay this is a clean show room yeah so uh, this this is not how it looks in an interventional room and an intervention room is full with stuff so now imagine there's uh, there's your nice anesthesia machine that is typically located here and somebody, somebody pushed it just 10 centimeters too close to here and this rotates with uh, 50 degrees per second and you make this pretty heavy. What will happen is it will hit the anesthesia machine, and uh, if you don't, if you're not able to decelerate very quickly, then it might push it against somebody. Or imagine a person standing there. It, they, the heavier you see them, is the more harm you can do to the person. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, so the acceleration is of course different when you start rotating this, but you have uh, machinery in there that that is actually uh, also sensing how fast it accelerates. Yeah. But uh, in general, uh, the the mechanical stability of this thing is truly a challenge, um, and the nice thing is uh, that the CRM systems are fairly reproducible. So when you do the same motion with the same kind of acceleration, you will get the same motion and therewith at every camera position you will get the same projection matrix. So still um, the intrinsic, we will talk about intrinsic parameters like F uh, also shortly. So they will slightly change but not too much. Uh, but we will calibrate extrinsic and intrinsic parameters in one go anyway. The, but in a C-arm system it's different than if you have a camera because typically in a camera you're rotating the entire camera and your uh, image plane is like very close to the sensor. And this way, um, because it's through a lens system, yeah. So you actually have this, this pinhole camera, and the, the chip is on the other side of the of the lens. So there, you always have a fixed uh, image plane with respect to your optical center, and there with the rotation, so you can perfectly uh, distinguish between extrinsic and intrinsic parameters, which is slightly different in in a source detector uh, scenario as we have here in the CM system. But most of this theory that we are actually looking at here is from computer vision. But it turns out that the flat panel detector has exactly the same geometric description, although the setup is slightly different. But the math is exactly the same. So if you go to a computer vision class, you will learn exactly the same about homogeneous coordinates. You will learn about um, also the calibration uh, algorithms. They are also the same. OK. So. What we need to do in order to express that, we essentially have uh, 3D points and we have to rotate and translate them such that we map back to our space where our camera system is aligned with the C-axis. So it can any take any point in space uh, that is in world coordinates and rotate and translate it such that it will be mapped to a point in my camera coordinate system. And the camera coordinate system I can always find in a way that it is aligned with the C-axis. So we can do that by rotation and translation. And now this is affine, yeah? Um, so this is, we have to multiply with a matrix here and we have to add some T here. So uh, again, no matrix here, too bad. Well, what can we do? Well, we can use our friends, the homogeneous coordinates. And with homogeneous coordinates, you will see that our affine mapping suddenly becomes a linear mapping. So if you uh, include this point here, 
we go to our 4D uh, projective space and then we can find a matrix with a rotation matrix here, the translation vector here, a 1 here and zeros here, which will describe exactly the rotation and translation as a linear mapping. And now we can do uh, pretty cool stuff because we can take this matrix D and directly multiply it to our matrix P. Yeah? So we take the point, multiply with D, multiply with P, and what will actually happen is I can find a matrix that, of course, looks differently like this one, but I can find a matrix that is simply the multiplication of uh, P, if this is the matrix P. I think we will call it capital P later. There's more chalk here. So let's call this guy P here. P. And then I can just take my homogeneous point and I can take the matrix D and then I multiply with our matrix P. And this is uh, a matrix of the same uh, dimensionality as this one. So if I want to calibrate the two at the same time, I can just calibrate the product of those two matrices. And now that's cool, right? So it's just one matrix that we get in the end. And now I can go ahead and say, well, let's look a bit at intrinsic parameters. Now, what's intrinsic parameters? Well, in January, these are the parameters that are dependent on your, on your camera, like on the manufacturing on your camera. So this could be things like, uh, like the focal length, uh, our F, or it could be things that are uh, associated with the, uh, with the coordinate system of your, of your sensor. So typically, in a camera sensor, you have your origin on the top left. So the zero, zero pixel index is in the top left, and then you have increasing coordinates to the right and to the bottom. So the, uh, the, the, the point where the normal uh, is aligned, as, or the, the point where the z-axis intersects the image plane, is not necessarily the origin of your detector coordinate system, because you shift it. So typically, you align your system in a way that you have the optical center all aligned here and your image plane like this, but you're indexing on the very top of your detector. So there's still um, an affine transform in order to change to this point within your detector coordinate system. And then you might have an imperfect, um, you ha may, may have non-square pixels so let's say your pixel has a different uh, uh, width than, than height, which will introduce, let's say the pixel is uh, 150 microns in width, but only 100 microns in height. Then you will have a different scaling on the two axes of your detector system. So you have to consider the scaling of the axis. And then let's say you have some trouble with manufacturing um, your detector and those two axes, they're not perfectly aligned, so they're not perfectly per perpendicular, but slightly skewed. Then you also have to be able to consider the skew angle between your two coordinate axes. And uh, we have the, yeah, so th what else do we have? Um, yeah, the origin, yeah, okay, good. And then a different focal length. If you have a radial distortion, we are not considering this here. Yeah? We're not considering radial distortions and stuff in this camera model. We assume we can only have a skew and different shaped pixels or different sized pixels. So you can describe these intrinsic parameters. Um, let's say this is the, the origin of your camera or of your projection coordinate system, but this is what your detector is actually acquiring. So you have the slant between the two axes and you have, different, uh, you have a different center. So you have to project this center onto this point, you have to consider the skew, and you have to consider the size of the pixels. And if you do that, and this is just a summary of the parameters we've just seen, you can actually find that, um, well, you have to describe this coordinate by 1 uh, over x, and if you have a skew, you have to consider your angle here, which will give you a, a total matrix. So this is, this is all happening just within the detector plane. Yeah, so we can write up this as a single uh, two by two matrix. And then of course you have to invert it, uh, which will give you kx minus kx um, uh, cosine the angle over sine the angle 
and uh, Ky on the last component in the 2-2 two, uh, two, two index. This is only happening within the detector plane. Yeah? This is only the skew and the different sh uh, shaped pixels. Now you also have this, uh, this affine uh, transform wave you have to shift by the center here. This is you, what you still also need to consider also within the detector plane. And you can use the same trick that instead of shifting with a translation here, you take your matrix T and put it into the upper left corner and the translation here and you map this all to homogeneous coordinates again. So we're using this trick again that our affine mapping becomes linear and homogeneous coordinates. And we end up with a three by three matrix that en encodes the pixel sizes, the skew, and the center. And uh, this is our camera matrix K. This is a three by three matrix. And now you realize we had done, we have the world point, we uh, ro rotate into the camera coordinate system, then we project. And all that we need to do is now map to the actual uh, coordinates to the indices of our, uh, of our detector array. And this is described by k. So we can just multiply k with p with d and describe our uh, homogeneous uv point uh, with a single projection matrix that again uh, has the same format as here. So we have a total um, uh, of 12 uh, unknowns in here and it's up to scaling. So we have 11 uh, degrees of freedom in, in, a, in the matrix that we wish to estimate. Yes? Yeah, D is a four by four matrix. Yeah. So it has the three by three rotation matrix on the top left, the translation vector, and then uh, uh, three zeros and a one in the last. Yeah. So this is a this is a four by four matrix and this is a three by three matrix. And this is just the projection matrix P in here. Okay. So this is um, very nice because uh, this way we are able to describe the complete projection, and the complete projection is what we just developed here. So we had this projection matrix, this, this is now indicated as P proy, and we now can find a single matrix P that describes the extrinsic, the intrinsic, and the, uh, and the mode of um, projection in a single matrix form, in a single linear form in homogeneous coordinates. And this is pretty nice, and this is very useful. Okay, so how can we calibrate this? Well, what we need to do to calibrate, of course, we need a calibration pattern. And for the calibration pattern, we, we design a phantom or we print a calibration pattern that will allow us detection of points. And we manufacture it in a way that we er very accurately get the, the, so that the phantom is manufactured very accurately and we exactly know the associated 3D coordinates. So what we do actually is we align our world coordinate system. Our world coordinate system is defined with respect uh, of the detectable points in our phantom. So our world accord coordinate system during our calibration step will be aligned with the phantom. Now if you rotate the phantom, then you will get and take another image, then you will get uh, a different camera position because everything is defined with respect to the phantom. And this is, uh, this is an old phantom that they used to calibrate. So this had a bit sequence encoded here. Uh, and you were, they were thinking about actually uh, having it as a collar around your neck. And then you can uh, do a scan and calibrate on the fly. So this is the... the feature point pattern that is encoded here and you have uh, a stop bit sequence so you have to detect sorry no this is the stop bit sequence so this sequence here and this sequence here appears again and in between you have enco encoded the position along this full circle yeah so you have to de uh, to detect those triangular shapes and every and in between of those uh, four lines of beads you have always four uh, lines of beads that actually encode an ID. And if you would detect one of those, no, two of those triangles and this code in between, you can figure out this code. And if you have decoded this code here, 
you, for every bead that you have detected, you will have the perfect world coordinates. In fact, this was an early prototype. What is um, this is for a typical camera system that you can use this point or checkerboard uh, uh, based uh, systems. And what you find in a typical C arm calibration is, is this phantom here, and this is called the PDS2 phantom. And this is um, this are actually beads, small metal beads. Bec metal beads are useful because you can detect them very easily in an X-ray projection. They are highly absorbing. So the detection task is easy. You align them on a helix. You, you put it onto a helix because then you have a 3D structure. So it will always cover a 3D space. Um, what next thing that you do is, so this is a total of 108 spheres, um, spheres, be beads or balls, yeah, as you may call them. And those 108 spheres, they have a small size and a large size. So the small size is uh, maybe 1.6 millimeter and the large size is 3.2 millimeter, so like twice the, the, the size. And doing so, you encode a bit sequence into there. And you design a code such that if you detect seven beads in a row, this code is unique. In the 108 uh, uh, bead sequence, this, uh, a sequence of seven beads appears only once. The same bit pattern only appears once. So what you do is you put this into, you take an image like this, then you start detecting the beads here, 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 and you easily get seven in a row in each of these arms of the helix. And if you do that, you can decode the, the seven bit code that is encoded along here, and then you immediately uh, also get uh, the IDs of all of these beads, and you get the IDs of all of these beads because you can detect the seven bit code again. And then you can, uh, can get for all the beads you detected along those arms, you can get correspondences. And because you have uh, defined word coordinate positions for every of those points here, you can immediately get the 3D position. So if we do that, we have the 3D position. And because of, uh, we did a projection of this, we also have the 2D position. So then we have a set of points where we have known 3D positions and known 2D positions. And if we have that, then we can set up uh, a system of equations where we are looking for our unknown projection parameters. So we set up, um, we have the 3D points, we have the 2D points, and then we figure out the matrix in between. This is our calibration procedure. And we have to find um, uh, those 12 unknowns in order uh, to compute our projection matrix. So this is, again, the specs. Uh, we have large and small spheres that present a 1 and a 0. And we have, oh, it's actually 8-bit binary encoding not a 7-bit encoding, sorry. And if we do that, we can decode. We get the ID of each of the beads. And with that, we get the world coordinate position. And from the world coordinate position, we know the 3D points. From the projection, we know the 2D points. And we can go ahead and calibrate. And we got this hint. The world coordinate system is attached to the phantom. So if you start, if you want to compare different calibrations, and you put the phantom in on day one, you calibrate, and then you want to figure out on day two if it's the same robustness, and you put in the phantom again, and you'd rotate it, you, your result will be that your calibration is messed up every day. Well, the reason why you messed it up is because you moved the phantom. Yeah? So if you want to do a reproducibility study, uh, you either do not move the phantom, or you normalize somehow um, for your word for your change in, in phantom position. Yeah. So maybe, um, yeah, so for example, if you have several projections and you're always taking the same sequence of projections, you could instead of, um, if you're rotating about the phantom, for example, then you could define a new world coordinate center that is exactly in the, uh, in the ISO center of your rotation. So you have to compute the isocenter of your rotation, and then you can assign a new world coordinate system. This would be one way to solve that. Good. So, level we can look into a simple case, but this case is very... So let's say we 
get rid of all the parameters that we talked about. We only have um, the focal length. This is our 3D point and this is our 2D point. Because of the calibration phantom, we know this and we know this. Well, then we can solve for f. And one way to do that is uh, I just put up the two equations, right? So I get f, uh, uh, f times uh, p10 divided by uh, p12 equals to q1 uh, to qi0 and f times pi1 divided over pi2 uh, equals to qi1. And if you do that, you can set up the following um, optimization problem. But instead, uh, you can same take the same two equations and uh, you can just multiply by pi2. And what will happen is you get this set of equations. And now you get this optimization problem. Okay? So depending on how you change the, the uh, equations above, you can find a different uh, objective function. So uh, in order to find the optimal f hat. And this is actually fun. So you could go ahead and actually set up uh, also this optimization problem. And you could compare that. So that would be an interesting exercise problem and see which one is more robust, for example. In the very end, uh, we, we are not just interested in the focal length, right? So in the very end, we are interested in extrinsic, intrinsic, and everything. So the unknowns that we're looking for are P11 to P34. These are all the unknowns that we want to calibrate. And of course, we can also find an optimization problem for that. And we do very similar as we did in the, in the refresher course on SVD. Um, we can actually rearrange that. So this is, you know, uh, you note here that if I multiply this with this, I get two equations here, and I can use those two equations and set up a system of linear uh, of um, uh, I can set up a system of equations. And what you would realize in this one here is uh, this is not linear in p. Yeah. So um, so you have uh, p also in the denominator. And this is not very nice. Yeah? So this is a nonlinear system of equations. But you can use the same trick. So you multiply um, uh, on both sides. So this is a nonlinear estimator. But now if I multiply, no, come on. Doesn't want to show the next slide. OK. So I can use the same trick again. So I multiply with this term and with this term. And suddenly, I get a linear system of equations. Yeah? So we are only looking for p. And if we do that, we can rearrange that in a measurement matrix, as we did previously. We get a measurement matrix of this shape. And we get a vector with unknowns. So this is a vector with 12 unknowns. And uh, this is a vector of zeros. And these are all my measurements. These are essentially the coordinate 2D and 3D coordinates of my points. And I plug all of them into a big matrix. And once I plug them into a big matrix, I can uh, solve for the null space of the system of equations. So I'm looking for the null space of M. And this will give me my projection matrix. Good. So we can uh, compute the null space. And also interesting is uh, we know that, uh, we, we know that uh, this has 12 unknowns, but uh, it ha only has 11 degrees of freedom yeah, because we have up to scaling. And uh, therefore, we uh, can also, um, so first of all, we can use M, uh, uh, we can use SVD to compute the null space of M. Uh, but the rank of M, of course, is also 11. Yeah. So we can uh, associate it to this. OK, good. Um, so one thing that you can do is, um, uh, yeah, you can also reformulate this as an eigenvalue, eigenvector problem, and then also use uh, Lagrange multiplier methods. Okay, good. So we can. Uh, so we now we found a way to actually compute our projection parameters. We can compute it with SVD, and we get uh, some results with that. And uh, we can, for example, use the linear estimator to use it as an initialization for a nonlinear uh, least square estimator of the project matrix. So these are a couple of things that you can try and play around with. 
In general, we identified a linear way of computing our projection matrix, and now we really run into trouble um, when we want to uh, estimate our projection matrix and we have outliers because this is a least square optimization problem and if we have outliers in our data we will get uh, quite some trouble with the uh, calibration of our matrix. So typical problems are badly localized points. So let's say you identified a sphere in the projection but you did not identify exactly the center but some, some slightly shifted version of that. Or what is really bad is when you have wrong correspondences. You mix up a large sphere with a small sphere and suddenly all your correspondences are wrong and you get totally wrong projection matrices. So if that happened, uh, then you don't get the right, uh, right answer. So you have to figure out which points to trust and which points are not reliable. And one way to deal with this is RANSAC. And this is the random sample consensus. And in RANSAC, so this is again our, our example, and here we do a line fitting. And let's say you have this set of points. So this is one, two, three, four, five, and six. And this is point number seven, and number seven is an outlier. Now if you do a least square six, uh, if you do a least square fit of this, uh, then you will get this line. This line here is the least square fit of all of those points. And if I kick out point number six, I get this point here. So also a very bad fit. But if I kick out point number seven, then I suddenly get this fit here, this dotted fit here. See this dotted line? This is the fit without seven. So the idea in RANSAC is that you just run multiple estimates. And with the multiple estimates, you take the minimal set of points that you actually need to compute the solution. And in this case, it's a line, so you just take two points and you compute, um, just you draw, draw randomly and you compute different line models. And what you do then is you compute the number of inliers and outliers. So you define a threshold and say, if my point is closer to the line than maybe one, then it's an inlier. And if it's uh, further away than one, uh, it's an outlier. And you will see that this line, for example, will only produce 0.3 and 0.4 as inliers. And maybe without six, uh, it will produce two and seven as inliers. So those two lines have very few inliers. But the ideal one, as well as without seven, have one, two, three, four, five, six inliers. Yeah. So we have six inliers here because we uh, have shown out the, the outlier. And dependent on what you do here, uh, you can then identify the line that produced the most inliers, and then you can take this line as the final estimate result. If you do so, of course, uh, be careful. Um, you have to consider the statistics. You, you do random sampling. Uh, if you have a probability of only 1% for outliers, you have to do fewer samples than if you have uh, 20 or 30 percent uh, of outliers. Uh, so if you have many outliers, you have to draw much more often in order to get a robust estimate here. But um, we're actually not going through the math here. Uh, if you're interested, I can tell you how to do that. Or if you're uh, attending DMIP, uh, we are also typically going through the uh, mathematical or statistical analysis, how many, in, uh, uh, how many draws you have to do from the set of points that you get a stable or at a given probability. So you want to have a 99 uh, percentage chance that you have a model that only includes inliers. And you can actually derive this from Bernoulli trials. Okay, but the general RANSAC algorithm is, so d don't, don't do don't do RANSAC if you have not, if you did not consider the math of how many tries to take. Uh, if you have a lot of uh, outliers, then you may end up with having to compute many, many models that you actually get something that is robust. So only use RANSAC if you actually uh, thought about the randomness of your process, because if you draw uh, not often enough, if you just draw 10 times, you get just random results. 
you, you have to make sure that you have at least uh, drawn as many times that you have a certain probability to produce a good model. So you draw random samples, um, then you compute the model parameters, you evaluate, you count the number of inliers, and um, if you have, and, and then you repeat until you have found the model with the most inliers. Yeah. And the hypothesis is the model with the most inliers is the best estimate. Good. Some take home messages. Um, we have discussed projection models. We've seen that if you add a dimension, it's much easier to calibrate um, a perspective uh, projection. So this is much easier. We talked about projection matrices. The projection matrices are really cool because we can you, uh, describe the extrinsic and intrinsic parameters all at the same time. And we've seen uh, how we can compute camera calibration using these squares. And we used our favorite method, SVD, to actually compute the parameters. And we've seen a bit uh, how to use RANSAC in order to cope with outliers. Good. So some further readings. Uh, these, this is the book that I was referring to. Uh, Hartley Scissorman uh, is Multiple View Geometry in Computer Vision. is a very good book if you're interested more in the geometry. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Fougera, Three Dimensional Computer Vision and Geometric Viewpoint. It's also excellent to read, MIT Press. Do you have any questions? No questions? Then I wish you a lot of fun. Uh, no lectures next week because there's uh, back Tuesday and uh, we will skip over the first day lecture so you can enjoy the entire Bergkirchwey and I hope you have a lot of fun. Be safe and come back to the lecture in two weeks. <laughs>